uh, what's called a uh, Missouri Technical Specialist with the AWRL is my official league appointment. And one of the things that uh, as technical specialists we do is go around and talk about technology. Uh, among other things, such as radio interference, et cetera, et cetera. However, today I'm here to talk about digital radio. I'm also president of the Missouri Digital Group. We do digital systems here in the St. Louis area. Uh, we've been doing that since 2006. Actually, 2005, December, we put up our first system. That was a D-Star system. Since then, we've kind of branched out and we do a little bit of everything. From that standpoint, I do have a question kicking it off. Uh, the, uh, you know, although some people think CW is the first digital system where you had, you know, dits and dahs, ones and zeros, does anybody want to venture a guess when you think mobile radio, digital mobile radio first became available? When they invented the car horn. <laughs> <laughs> no. Close. Good. Anybody else? Any guess on a decade? 30s. Nope. 30s was still Armstrong and, and that sort of thing and FM. Actually, digital land mobile radio has been here since in the 1980s. I put a digital land mobile radio system in for, at the time, Union Electric uh, at our Callaway nuclear plant in about the mid-1980s. And it was one of the first ones around. It was made by Do Motorola, and they call it digital voice protection because it was designed for public safety so you could encrypt voice, which was better than the other encryption methods that they had at the time, which was basically single sideband on FM or the inversion scramblers from that standpoint. So digital mobile radio has been around for a while. Let's see if I can make sure this works. Here we go. But it's, it's only been recently, since you know early 2000s, that it started coming into amateur radio. Uh, before that, we had FM, handy talkies, mobiles, uh, converted uh, boat anchors, that sort of stuff for uh, our radio equipment. But in uh, early 2000s, actually 2004, 2005, uh, ICOM started bringing in digital radio. It was called D-Star. And the development of that got, got the amateurs started into uh, digital mobile radio. So now today there are several protocols out there that amateurs use, and I kind of want to go over them a little bit. Uh, the first one is D-Star. That, that protocol was developed by the Japanese Amateur Radio League. It was supported by ICOM. And uh, now ICOM and Kenwood make equipment for D-Star. So they actually make handhelds, mobiles, and that sort of thing. Here's a couple of examples of that. So that started out in 2005. Uh, then a couple of years ago, about 2011 or so, 2010, the Azu brought out System Fusion, which is another digital protocol, a digital system, for amateur radio. So D-Star and Fusion are developed specifically for amateurs as a digital radio system. Uh, hence you see a lot of things such as call signs in there and, and uh, you know, your calls being CQ, CQ and that sort of thing in the radios when you get them set up. So that was the first, you know, some of the first ones. Then we have this thing called Digital Mobile Radio, or DMR. How many people have not heard of DMR? Well, at least we have one honest gentleman in the front here. <laughs> DMR, or Digital Mobile Radio, was a standard that was developed in Europe by the European Technical Standard Institute, or ETSI, using intellectual properties from several of the major land mobile radio manufacturers. It was designed for commercial land mobile radio. And uh, it was uh, also known in the United States as Moto Turbo. That was their brand name for DMR that they put on it. So it's a commercial standard. But a group of amateurs in a club called DMR, Mar formed a club called DMR Mark. And Mark stands for Motorola Amateur Radio Club. And they were Motorolians 
who said, you know, we could use this on ham radio. And they figured out a way to do that, to adopt the DMR commercial system and use it on ham radio. And it gives us several advantages, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Well, also another couple of commercial systems that are out there that amateurs so happen to have decided to play with is P25. P25 stands for APCO Standard P25. Uh, APCO is the Association of Public Safety Communications Officers, is the, what that acronym is, and they develop standards for use by public safety, public service, police. Is everybody aware that most public safety agencies now are on APCO P25 in the St. Louis metropolitan area? Has anybody heard of an acronym called SLATER? A few gentlemen out here. That is an APCO P25 Phase II standard compliant system. And there's advantages to public safety for that. Well, because public safety has moved to Phase II and has generated a lot of used equipment, amateurs now have adopted the old Phase I equipment which is P25, for, the, for amateur use. It's not as prevalent, however it is here in St. Louis. So St. Louis has D-Star, DMR, Fusion Systems, and one P25 system over in the Alton area that's up and running, or I think it still is from that standpoint. And then the other standard was called NXDN, and it was developed by Kenwood and ICOM. ICOM calls it IDAS, I-D-A-S. I don't know what that stands for. And Kenwood calls it NXDN. That was Kenwood's name for it. It's another standard for commercial mobile radio, very similar to some of the others, like P25 and, and so on and so forth. But as we know, you have Yezu, you have Kenwood, you have a Linko, you have various manufacturers, they all want to do their thing. It's the same way in Land Mobile from that aspect. So that's kind of the standards that are there. But when you look at it from an amateur basis, the first three, D-Star, DMR, and Fusion, are the big three. That's what amateurs collectively have gathered to. So this is kind of an eye chart, and I'm not going to go into this detail, but it's here to kind of prove a point. First thing to kind of, you know, as a technical specialist, I want to teach you something. So this is kind of our teaching chart here. Across the top we have various things that make up the packets that get sent out over the air that contain your voice. The first thing up there you'll see is the protocol. The protocol is just the headers that are wrapped around your voice packets so that the uh, systems know what to do with them. So the protocols contain things like to, from, where are you headed, where are you going, who is this for, that sort of thing. What it's all about, is it voice, is it data, uh, that's important here in this particular packet, that sort of thing. The next is the vocoder. How many know what a vocoder is? Vocoder is short for voice coder. Vocoder is the software algorithm now, it used to be hardware, that basically takes your voice and turns it into ones and zeros. Now that you know that, what do you have in your pocket or on the table? A cell phone. A cell phone. Guess what it contains? A vocoder. A vocoder. That is the principal building block of any digital system. Even for digital voice over shortwave, they all have the vocoders in them to turn your voice into digits. That's been done for years. They've gotten very good at it because they can take an 8 kilohertz voice signal and pack it into a small amount of digits. So it makes it very efficient. So that's a vocoder. The other thing in any system is the bandwidth. How much space does that take up? Is that important to amateurs? Probably not so much. 
but it sure is important to the FCC because they want to squeeze more people in the spectrum, more users per spectrum. So they do that by looking at the effective bandwidth of the signal. One of the reasons that DMR took off, particularly in the commercial area, is because it's more spectrally efficient. We'll get into that in a minute. The next thing, of course, that you have in any digital system is your modulation and your multiplexing. Well, what are those? Well, modulation, if you're an amateur and you took this test, I hope you know what modulation is. That's how you... Yeah. You get the signals together so they go out in the air and they have information in them and it's not a carrier. So even CW, you're modulating the carrier on and off to send your information. So modulation is how we get the information on the carrier. And multiplexing is how we effectively get information and users in a given bandwidth from that standpoint, a given chunk of spectrum. So if you want to look at it, there's two types of, of multiplexing up here that you can see, FDMA and TDMA. One stands for frequency domain multiple access. The other stands for time domain multiple access. Well, frequency domain means just that, channels in a bandwidth of frequency. So let's guess or kind of look at things. Two meter band plan, is that TDMA or is that FDMA? Does anybody want to venture a guess? FDMA, right? Frequency domain, each channel gets a user, gets a system. So that's what they call frequency domain. So FDMA is just another term for channels F in an FM spectrum. TDMA is a little different. Now we're splitting it up not by frequency, we're splitting it up by time. So channel one may be this time, and channel two may be the next time just after that. And then channel one, channel two as time goes by. Remember the early days of cellular when they first became digital? How many people had an AT&T cell phone? All of us. A lot of us. The first AT&T cell phones were TDMA. They had a piece of bandwidth given to them by the FCC, and they broke it up into, anybody want to venture a guess? 30 time slots. So they could put 30 users on one channel, 30 simultaneous conversations on one channel, breaking that up. Of course, you're going to send your voice data out. So the efficiency of the vocoder, how much bits you send out for voice, now we all know that spectrum is not very friendly. You got noise, you got interference, you got multipath. So you add some forward error correcting so that when you get a corrupted packet, the radio can figure out what you really said in your voice. So that's what the FEC is for. All these protocols also add additional bits for other stuff, like data. So example, on D-Star, we have 1,200 bits of data with every voice packet that goes out there. So that's how your position gets sent to the eye gate to go out on APRS.5. So that has your GPS data. It can also be used to send textual messages back and forth just using the data portion of that from that standpoint. And of course then it adds up to the number of bits that you're sending out. So you see when we start to look at this chart we kind of notice all the protocols are different. The vocoders, if you look at this chart, anybody notice? Let's see. Go on. We got four uses of AMBE2 we got one use of A and B E. You think those are about the same? Well, they actually are. 
DVSI developed ABME, ABME first, AMBE first, easy for me to say. So when they came out with a better product, they made AMBE plus two. What's in the D-Star radio is AMBE, what's well, in all the rest of them is plus two. Today, in a radio, do you think it can do either? Yes, because it's all in software. Or it's in a chip where you send it commands to say, I want you to be an AMBE vocoder, I want you to be an AMBE plus two vocoder. Uh, APCO came out with IMBE, or used IMBE, which is another flavor, because it sounded better to the cops and the fire guys. And that's important if you're in the burning house or you're in a chase. You want to make sure people understand what you're saying and the inflection of your voice and so on and so forth. A IMBE was here before AMBE plus two. Notice now they've adopted the newer software vocoders so that they can uh, leverage that. The modulations are all pretty similar. Uh, these I'm not even going to go into. They're big words. They're fancy modulation schemes. 4FSK and C4FM are two ways of saying the same thing. There's just a little bit of difference, so the engineers decided to call them something different. And of course, GMSK is Gaussian minimum shift keying, which was an early one. Notice they all kind of use the same number of voice bits. D star is using 2400 versus 2450, which kind of accounts for the difference in the voice quality between Fusion, DMR, and, DSR, and uh, D star. They're all using similar uh, forward error correcting of P25 because they had the bits have bigger uh, data slots because they're sending more bits over the channel. But that's all pretty much, you know, they're very similar. Also notice, this is six and a quarter. This is six and a quarter. Those are very efficient. The FCC would like those. But you, do you know why the FCC also likes this one and this one? TDMA. TDMA. Get two signals in the same two, two slots in one band. So the FCC calls that an equivalent spectrum efficient channel. Therefore, when Motorola went out to sell Moto Turbo, they hit the market right when the FCC was mandating narrow banding. So for example, Bear down the street, I call them Bear, they used to be Monsanto until this week, had a five channel analog system for their security. They had to, man, they were mandated to narrow band that. So what did they do? They bought a Moto Turbo system of five channels worth. Now they have 10 voice slots and they meet the FCC requirements. Very clever marketing on the back, behalf of Motorola. They sold a ton of that equipment. Because they've done that, people are refreshing their equipment and a lot of the stuff shows up used now. When did, what was the deadline of the narrow banding? 2013. Was the final, final deadline. As they pushed it back several times. I think some public safety even pushed it back a little further with STAs, but. Yeah. I think Christian Hospital, they, they had an ambulance department, and I think that they got a reprieve for like six months because I remember them taking the stuff out at some point, and they're like, we got to get this out today. Yeah. I mean, finally, the FCC's put their foot down, which takes them years to do. And they got that accomplished and got everybody moved. 2011 was the last year you could sell a radio that was not capable of right. narrow banding. But then 2013 is when you had to go. Yeah. And you had to buy a new license, too. Yeah, your license got updated whether you wanted to or not. Yeah. You got issued a new license by the commission. And so that was basically it. The only exceptions were the people that were up in the 7-800 range where it was already using trunking systems that were already considered spectral efficient. 
and they were not mandated to do anything, which made me very happy because I didn't have to do anything with all my trunk radio systems, which would have been expensive. So that's it. So, you know, you look at this chart, how many would say, yeah, yeah, they're pretty close to one another. Yeah, variations here, variations there, but they're all basically doing the same thing. Well, I don't know if you've heard of a guy by the name of Brian Hoyer. In the 2015 DCC in Chicago, Brian is one of the principals in Northwest Digital Radio that have done quite a few things from a digital standpoint. He says, you know, basically when you looked at that chart, you saw all the similarities between the systems. His take was, well, they're 95% the same, but they're 100% incompatible. Yeah, you think. A lot, lot, and amateurs are working on that. Believe it or not, we're going to talk about that. So you're saying in the future I might be able to update the student radio to be able to be ha work with all the different digital. Given but enough horsepower, yes, because it's all software. Nice. Yes, this is software defined radio. Right, but you got to get there. So let's talk about TDMA for a second, since a lot of people didn't understand what that's about. TDMA, like I said, is time division multiple access. Basically, it splits the RF data stream into 30 millisecond time slots. What that does, and of course, the radios access their time slot based on the programming. So if you've played with DMR, or you've heard me talk about DMR, or been in one of my programming classes, that's one of the key pieces of information you need to know what time slot for what talk group you need to know that to program your radio. There's some control bits between those time slots for the system to use. Uh, the repeaters provide the syncing. So this two slot TDMA only works on a repeater because the repeaters help keep all the user equipment in sync. It works on simplex, we only use one time slot, and it's time slot one. So you can use simplex with TDMA. The key thing that people find with DMR is the batteries last a lot longer. Anybody want to venture guess why? Yeah, you're only transmitting half the time. Slot. So, yep. it, but you can stack that. Yeah, you're only transmitting basically half the time. When you key down, it's only transmitting half the time. And I can demonstrate that. <clears throat> I got my trusty Motorola here. <clears throat> I've got a Kenwood on one channel. And I've actually got this one tuned to simplex. Well, if I key this down, you'll hear it. What's happening is this transmitter 50 is 50% duty cycle. Yep, I, I, you can still hear me talk. Maybe you can use your eye, I guess. What's that? It, it's less than average. You cannot do a power measurement on a TDMA, DMR repeater in digital mode. You have to actually switch them to analog to measure the power output because it'll come up a lot less do the averaging of the watt meters. Even a peak reading watt meter will not catch it from that standpoint. So you can see how efficient it is from battery life standpoint. I can talk a long time on a DMR radio, and comparatively speaking, but for a uh, analog radio, analog or another digital radio like Fusion or like D-Star, when I key down, it's sending bits out constantly. It's keyed up. Now, if you listen on a non-DMR radio to a DMR repeater, you will not hear that. So. You know, you go home and you dial up our repeater and want to listen. Every time it comes up, it's solid. You don't hear it doing that. Why? 
is it's sending out both time slots. Every time it transmits, it sends out both time slots. Why? It's syncing all the users to the time slots. So that's kind of interesting. Let's look at the functionality. Come a couple of key things. Uh, registration, DSTAR and DMR require you to register. So you have to register your call sign with that. And we'll get into that in a minute. The user ID, here's an interesting one. For Fusion, it's your call sign. For DMR, it's your call sign. Or not DMR, for uh, DSTAR, it's your call sign. Notice it's not your call sign for DMR. Why? Anybody venture, I guess? Huh? It's a standard. Yes, it's a commercial system. What do they use in commercial? Numbers. So every amateur that's on DMR has gone to a website, put in their call, and registered it. And within, it depends, it's run by volunteers. Within a day, they'll get an email back and say, your DMR ID is this. And that's what you put in your radio. Basically, it's a cross reference between the DMR ID and the call sign. And that's how they know who you are. Mm -hmm. Right. Except the radio doesn't. This it doesn't have a spot for your call sign. No, but at least it knows the num ID number. Yep. That's what I meant. Yes. So your D the subscriber ID in the DMR standard is married to your call sign. So like for myself, my subscriber ID is 3129044. And that's the number that I put in there. Now, for those of us that play in P25, we got to have a subscriber ID as well, or NXDN. So we basically use the same ID for both of those from that standpoint. They all do simplex. The next one's kind of interesting. Uh, they all do local uh, repeater operation. Uh, D-Star, you can link between two repeaters with D-Star. Uh, Fusion, you can now do that as well, provided you got the right flavor of repeater. Uh, and then you can make multiple repeater connections. And those are done with, with some things that we'll get into. It's called reflectors and talk groups and wires X rooms and all that kind of stuff. Uh, two of them, DMR and DSTAR, will let you route calls to another ham one on one. Uh, so DSTAR, it's called call sign routing. In that particular case, I can be in Albuquerque, New Mexico on a D-Star system and I can talk back to K0GOB, my buddy and partner in crime here in St. Louis by just loading his call sign in my radio in the proper slot and pressing push to talk. Now he has to know to do the same to talk back to me. For the commercial standard DMR, that's built in. That's a big thing for commercial talk from one subscriber unit to the other. And you can do that in amateur DMR systems. However, most of the amateur DMR operators do not prefer that you do that. Why? Yeah, you tie up a time slot. It's okay, as far as we're concerned, that, you know, I could get on and say, call Kyle and say, Kyle, I'm here, where are you? And he could come back and tell me that, and we clear the time slot, that's fine. But they don't like it when two guys get on there and they chew the rag for on, on and on and on, because now you're taking that resource away from anybody else that's wanting to use the system. <coughs> so from that standpoint. The other nice thing that two of these systems provide, I haven't found that Fusion does it yet, it's called echo test. It's also known as parroting in the DMR line. What that does is you get on your radio, you set up a D-Star radio for echo test, you key it up, you talk, and the system repeats back what you set. So you can tell exactly how well you're getting into the repeater, how well you're being received by just doing an echo test. It's the same thing 
on DMR, it's called a parrot. The only difference between the two is the parrot on DMR lives in the cloud. The echo, or the parrot on D-star, lives on the local gateway. So there's some reliability issues with the parrots on DMR versus D-star, but it's kind of a neat feature. And you can get a link status, but that's not really important. Okay, networks. I think one thing as a digital user you have to understand is how the networks are set up. It makes you a better user and you have a lot more fun with it. Because without the networks, what would we have? Just another repeater. And we got lots of repeaters now. In the St. Louis area, we got a ton of repeaters. You know, some do this, some do that. Some don't do anything other than take up space. But the networks and the digital systems make them, I think, fun. Because you can talk all over the world. I've talked to England. I've talked to Australia. You know, you can talk to somebody up in Canada. You know, anybody that gets on the network can talk. So let's take a look at the networks. Because this is really what makes them unique as systems. And I want you to pay attention to the networks as we scroll through them. This is a fusion network. This is what it looks like. What you have are your Wires X rooms, and those are servers sitting in Japan. So if we do not have internet connectivity to Japan, you do not have Wires X. Bottom line. And in fact, I think it was last year, or earlier this year, they had an internet routing problem to Japan, and all of Wires X was down for a day, at least from here. So if they have problems, it's not really distributed. It's centralized. Yezu owns it. It's their, th their baby. So you've got to go to Japan. But you do have things like these X reflectors, and we'll get into that in a minute. So then you have your Wires X servers. Your repeaters can connect to the Wires X servers directly or through uh, an HRI 200 node, which is another box sold by Yezu. Some of us have HRI 200 nodes. You can, if you want to go Wires X yourself without having a repeater, you buy a HRI 200 node, you set it up with your computer, and you're talking all over the world from your handheld to another radio that's sitting on that box. It creates your node. Well, a lot of us at Dayton were, how to say, complaining. I'm trying to figure out what the nice word would be. Strongly commenting. Strongly commenting to Yezu. You know, this is all well and good, but for MCOM, if we lose Japan, we have no way to link all these fusion repeaters together to do what we need to do. You know, with D-Star, we can do that because we can put up our own, our gateways will talk to one another as long as they know how to route things, as long as they've got one copy of the database, you know, yada, yada, yada. We can put them on their own networks, so on and so forth. We can't do that with Fusion. So, let's see, 2016? Yeah, last year in Hera. They announced the new repeater, the DR2X repeater. They called it System Fusion 2. And what they added, what was, what, which was called IMRS, which is another board that goes in a repeater and it has an Ethernet jack on it. It stands for Internet Linked Multi-Site Repeater System. So now you can take, as shown here, several DR2X repeaters right. and tie them all together. And then the users, using a new feature, called the DGID that you program in your radio can tell that repeater how to route your call through that network that's been created by the repeater owners. And that can be on a private network, that can be on the internet. There are some quirky things about that that we're still finding out, but it, people are starting to get those up and running. So in essence, I can come in on one repeater, go out on another, and come in on one repeater and go out on all three. You just 
you know, it routes you through based on how you have your radio set up. You're not on a Wires X room, but you could also tie Wires X through a node back into that network. Question. If you link IMRS and then put uh, HRI 200 in the back, it only um, allows you one or the other? Yes, that's as far as I know, that's all you you can do. IMRS and the remote node, yeah. but you cannot link have a direct connected HRI 200 and IMRS on that. So if you wanted to do IMRS linking on that repeater, you have to set up your Yes, that's basically how it's set up. Yep. So if you still lose your path to Japan in that set of servers, you lose wires X rooms. You lose wires X rooms. But you could gateway to DMR networks. You well, not really. You could. Why not? You, well, you got access to the net, right? You you're on the internet, but you're only talking from repeater to repeater to repeater. There's no gateway box to take yeah, you out. Yeah, no, you would need a gateway box, I realize, but you could put a gateway box at a repeater. Yeah, you could, and there's been some things that have been done, and we'll talk about that with this next step. Here is a, a reflector box. Now, reflector boxes are all over the place. They're set up by individuals. They run software that's been written by folks that's out there. What they allow is for, in the case of fusion, for hotspots. Everybody knows what a hotspot is. That's that little box that you spend your money on that connect and put it on your internet. Away you go with your radio to connect that back in to Wires X rooms. The primary means for that is FCF reflectors. And if you Google FCS reflectors, it'll take you to a site that will list them all. So you can see where they're at and what they're doing. And there's usually, you know, per reflector, there are a bunch of rooms. So FCS 001-whatever is, you know, America's link. So if you link your hotspot to that, you're on America's link, which is a wires X room. They do that on the back end with smoke and magic. That's which, a technical term? Yeah, that's a technical term, which is basically an HRI 200 aimed to wires X, okay, and then that's tied into this computer, and there's some cards in there that do all the protocol conversion and whatnot to get it working. In fact, it, they have to do some stripping of this and that to get it back into the right thing, but that's how they've done it. Now, if they don't have wires X connectivity, you still don't have wires X connectivity, but that's the way it's done. So notice that, yeah, okay, so you've got these servers, and you got repeaters, and you got hotspots. Quick question, George, about the uh, wires X servers, if they are in Japan, do you actually notice propagation delays? I can remember being on the phone, for example, talking to Australia, and there's a pretty significant crop delay. There are some delays, but you would never know it because of the protocol. You might see some dropouts. Typically voice is, uses what's called UDP or user datagram protocol. Well, networking guys like to call that spray and pray that it gets there. <laughs> because there's no connection based with that protocol. You put it out over the, into the ether, onto the internet, and if it don't get there, it don't get there. And you don't even know it. All right, well, let's look at the next one. Notice this network. Oh, a lot of similarities, isn't there, from that standpoint. We have, basically, DSTAR, you have two major networks. The US Trust Server Network, which you have to register on. And the other one out there that you have is called IRCDBB. And it's a different network. It was developed by a guy by the name of Jonathan Taylor in England. And he first developed it so that people who did not want to pay homage to the ICOM guys didn't have to do that, but they could still be on DSTAR. 
plain and simple. And a lot of the original hotspots got their start with his software. And a lot of them still run his software on the back end, and he's still supporting his software, which is kind of nice. IRC stands for Internet Relay Chat which is an internet protocol that allows people to chat back and forth on the internet. Only they're chat we're chatting with voice packets, not data packets. So you have IRCDB, you have your reflector boxes like we had before, you got your hotspots, you got your repeaters, you have two flavors of re three flavors of repeaters, a repeater with an ICOM gateway, a repeater with an IRCDB gateway, and a repeater with an ICOM gateway and an IRC DVD add-on, which lets you do both networks. So I've got one of those shown up there. So basically, you can go in on D+, you can come out on an IRC DVD gateway and communicate, so on and so forth. You can also have these DCS and X reflectors in the X reflector gateways that allow, the, allow us to do some interesting things. So X reflector really is a crossed protocol reflector. So they're starting to do a lot of work in the X reflector area where you can, that reflector will support multiple protocols coming into that reflector and going out to the point, okay, now we're starting to tie all the networks together. So that's what that is. Again, you know, we got the networks, we got the hotspots, the repeaters, and everything gets tied together. Where in the D, uh, fusion area, it was via the room. In the D-star area, it's via the reflectors. So it's fairly simple, but notice there's a lot of similarities between the two. So let's look at the, the last one here. This is DMR. This is my favorite network. Why? Politics is involved. Makes it real interesting. It's kind of exciting. Back in the day, when DMR was born, for amateur use, there was one network. It was a Seabridge network. DMR Mark started a Seabridge network. Why? Seabridge is a commercial product. It's designed for DMR. Motorola had a limitation. You could take a Motorola Master and tie 15 repeaters to it. After that, you were out of luck, unless you paid them lots of money. Well, Mom and Pa Radio Shop out in the middle of nowhere that's trying to tie a bunch of sites together for a customer and make money, that wasn't very nice for Motorola to charge him, you know, three arms and a leg to go past that 15 mark. So that was some enterprising people develop sea bridges. Raycom's one of them. Bridgecom, has anybody heard of Bridgecom? They also make a sea bridge. They sell them for reasonable money with additional licensing costs for ports for each repeater, so on and so forth. So this network grew up to support more than 15 repeaters. But this is a commercial product developed for Moto Turbo. So will it support anything other than a Motorola repeater? No, it won't. So over in Europe, Motorola isn't as prevalent. There's a company over there called Hytera. Has anybody heard of Hytera? Yeah, a few people have heard of Hytera. They make repeaters. They, they have lawsuits with Motorola and vice versa over intellectual property rights. So there was a group in Europe that developed DMR Plus, which is a network that supports high terror repeaters. But they also, since they weren't commercial, they could support hotspots, and they figured out how to add that to their network. But that was Europe. So we had US, we had Europe. They were beginning to tie them together, and then a group of Europeans came along and created a monster called Brandmeister. Good German name. I like that name. 
Brandmeister is another set of servers. However, they don't care. Bring your high terror repeaters. Bring your moto turbo repeaters. Bring your hotspots. We don't care, we'll support them all. And oh, by the way, you want to manage it? We'll give you a log on, you can manage your own. Sea bridges, if I, my system's on a sea bridge, if I want to change something, I have to go plead my case with the sea bridge manager. Little kingdoms. We were putting up a repeater out in Greenville and I wanted to add Illinois State to the repeater here because people in Illinois could hit our repeater in Missouri. I mean, RF doesn't know a boundary line. The Mississippi isn't the great divide that it really is. <laughs> and I argued for 30 minutes with a Seabridge guy in Chicago over why someone in Missouri should have access to the Illinois statewide talk group. True story. Political. Eventually, Brandmeister's get, gotten bigger than these two put together. And they'll let me log, if I'm on Brandmeister, I can log on and change whatever I want anytime I want it. But in the meantime, they have to talk to one another for everything to work. Because the talk groups are hosted, some talk groups are here, some talk groups are here, some talk groups are here. And it's whoever hosts those, you've got to go get it. So, uh, how many DMR users do we have in here? Have you been going down the road and all of a sudden you hear nothing? Now you know why. Packets get lost. You could be on a talk group that's hosted by a sea bridge, but you're talking on a repeater that's on Brandmeister, or vice versa. And if those two don't pass the data back and forth while you're in a real-time conversation, it will get lost. But, notice it's similar to the other two. Servers in the cloud, hotspot support, and repeaters. So, you know, when you look at it in the summary, DSTAR, basic connectivity is reflectors. DMR, it's called a talk group. Fusion is called a room. There's two networks in type in DSTAR. Three in DMR, as we just talked. Two in Fusion, IMRS and Wires X. You got all the uh, support for hotspots with them. They're 95% the same and 100% incompatible. Starting to see the message there? So, I've been doing this since 2006. I like to say sometimes I'm the St. Louis help desk for digital systems. Uh, through our website, we get a lot of inquiries. They usually come to me. So I kind of kind of broke things down as to what I see from user perspective. Programming. D-Star, you can do it with a dial. You can do it with D, uh, software. And then they have a mode called DR mode, which uses the GPS to determine where you're at and helps you program your radio. Uh, DMR, you have to use the software. Even though some radios now are coming out where you can front panel program them, don't buy that. There's usually some factor left out that still requires a computer to touch. And Fusion, what do you have to put in a Fusion radio? Your call sign, besides frequency and offset. What you have to do in all of them. Program complexity. D-Star, I think it's moderate to easy, especially if you're in DR mode. If you've got a D-Star radio and you have it, try DR mode, try it. I travel with a D-Star radio, DR mode's great. I wake it up, GPS finds out where I'm at. As long as my database and the radio's updated, I have all the repeaters I need right there. Just select them up, easy to do. DMR is very difficult. I've given lots of classes on how to program a DMR radio, how to create a code plug, as it's called, for a DMR radio. What I normally tell people is, they, I get an email, I just got a new DMR radio, whatever it is. 
And they say, what do I do first? I said, first you get your DMR ID. After you get that, you download our code plug on our website for St. Louis, and you load it in the radio. Then you go look at it, and you can start to figure out how you actually have to program the thing. And that makes it a lot easier to get started. Because if you've ever looked at a code plug in a DMR radio, it is not simple. It was developed by commercial people who have lots of technicians working for them that get paid to do that. So they didn't want to make it easy for a bunch of hams. They never thought hams would be wanting to use this. So Fusion's easy. The network, ease of use. Fusion and DSTAR is fairly moderate. Once you know how to use them, you can use them. DMR is simple. Change the knob position. You want to go on North America and you program your radio, North America is in channel position three, you switch. You watch the front of the radio till you get where you want to go as you twist that knob and now you're there. What do you do next? Key up. You're talking all over North America. You're lighting up every repeater that's listening to that talk group across North America. Can it get any simpler than that? Okay. Uh, learning curve, I think, is self-explanatory. Maturity, basically, DSTAR and DMR have been around for a long time, so they're fairly new. I call Yezu as evolving, you know, because they're still bringing stuff to fusion, you know, like the IMRS linking. Any questions? Yes. I got a few because I'm not digital yet. Okay. So, one of this is based a basic question in terms of battery life. I know it's like Yasu's got a cooler, so one of their units when you use a desktop, which kind of insinuates it draws more power. Is that necessarily true or not? I'm just thinking bad. So battery life about this uh, if you're if you're mobile or portable about the same as about the water. same. Okay. And so uh, they're all using the same. Class C amplifiers in them, so you know it's fairly efficient technology. Okay, I just thought maybe it had something to do with modulation or not. I just didn't understand the, the cooler. So yeah, I think that's just hype for you and maybe people in the group that are doing digital. So outside, well, I guess here's another one. So in terms of signal strength on analog, and I haven't done digital yet. When it gets pretty low in the noise, sometimes you can make it out. So Will digital operate at a lower signal level before it drops out? I'm assuming it just completely drops out once the signal level is too low. So in terms of like, you know, if you're in a, far from a repeater and the signal levels, level isn't so hot, you're more likely to get through with digital or analog? You think? Basically, I tell people digital is clear as a bell until you reach the limits and then it's gone. Typically, and there's a lot of people that argue one way or another, yet you may get a little more range out of a digital mode than you do out of analog just because, depending on your, the sensitivity of your radio, your setup, if you get down in the noise with analog, you may be able to pick them out, you may not. But with digital, as long as it's decoding the bit stream that's down there in the noise, you're going to hear it just as plain as we're talking. What will happen with digital is you'll get dropouts and mechanical noises, and then it's gone. But it's fairly fast. Uh, I drive the same route every day. I listen to our analog machines. I listen to our digital machines. There are places where my analog machine is giving me the picket fencing. You know what I'm talking about? The this, that, and the other. But the digital machine's on the same tower. Clear as a bell. I don't hear any of that stuff. It's just basically noise free up until the point that it's gone. Our D star systems when we're on the same when they're they're on the same tower even now as our analog systems and they typically cover out to the same points as our analog systems. They both, you know, after a while propagation takes over regardless of what system it is and you run out of coverage. <coughs> Yeah, that's like you think. Oh, will they? Yeah, that's like you think. All, 
I, quite frankly, since it's amateurs, they'll all exist. Yeah, uh, because they're, you know, we are not fans of one technology over the other, but I can tell you I've been at conferences where there have been devotees of fusion that were passionate about that. And I mentioned D-Star and they're, you know, giving me the, the cross sign, get away from me, that's evil. Or DMR is the CB band of the amateur radio. I started to hear that. Uh, that sort of thing. I think, Cliff, they'll all exist. I think amateurs, as resourceful as they are, are starting to figure out how to tie them all together. The goal would be regardless of whatever radio you show up with, you can talk to one another. You know, the public safety mandated that with APCO. That's how they solved that nut. But we can't do that because eight of our RL is going to pick, a, a, you know, somebody to support in this fight. It's up to the to the manufacturers, and then quite frankly, DMR is the, is the odd man out. It's just following whatever the commercial folks are doing. Yeah, and FCC's out of picking protocols as well. They right. Let the marketplace do that years ago. A uh, couple of questions: Where are your machines? And you mentioned something about classes that you have. Is that something that's I do digital classes. I did one for uh, uh, programming for St. Charles Club. I just, you know, send me an email, find a place, I'll show up and we'll talk about programming radios or whatever. I don't have preset classes, but I have done those for clubs in the past that they want to get a class together because there's interest in doing that from that standpoint. Our repeaters until... Uh, the end of July, we're located on a 220-foot tower at Lindbergh and Olive. Our repeaters today are still in the neighborhood, but they're not on that 220-foot tower. Uh, unfortunately, we were a victim of the Monsanto Bear merger, and they gave our tower to Danforth, and they're tearing that down to build greenhouses. So we had to take all the equipment out. Uh, right now, uh, the Red Cross was gracious to let us on their tower, so we got some of the systems on that tower. We've got one system on Danforth's building. What we found out is the coverage has been fairly good on all of them since we moved them. It's not like what we had for 28 years, but that's life in the city today. Yeah, this morning I had a long conversation with one of your guys over in uh, uh, St. Charles, something HP. Okay. I was attached to Kirkwood. He was attached to St. Charles, and on Fusion, they're saying we were talking to each other by way of Japan. Then. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because you're basically going to Japan, you're coming back. There's a round trip ticket, and you didn't even know fast. it. It's fast. It's the internet. Yes. Yeah, no less latency kicks in, or a router somewhere starts to hiccup. I want to get into this, so since I don't have an unlimited budget, I'm not going to buy one of each. So I'm thinking, basically, I think it comes down to this, right? If you want to be able to talk universally, it's analog. If it's digital, you're going to buy a system, you're going to talk to some people and not others, right? Or is that not right? That's not right. Digital. Digitally, you're, most digital nuts have them all. Somebody wants to get started in digital, you want to spend as little money as possible. DMR grew because of the Chinese radios. This is one of them I recommend. It's called Anytone. Was selling for 169 bucks. I don't know what the tariffs are doing to it, but so far the, the vendors are still holding the line on that. I don't think for long because they don't have the deep pockets, so it may go up. But they're great radios. They are DMR. Uh, the vendors pay the tax for to Motorola and Hytera for the DMR standards. So they are fully compliant. Now there are some Chinese out there. One of them start, the name particularly starts with a B. It ends with a fang. Bao fangs. They have a version out there that is not DMR tier two uh, compliant and it will mess up a DMR repeater faster than anything and you will become enemies of anybody and everybody that uses that repeater. But this is one. You can get into these, there's, there's others out there that are 
the Radio Oddity. Uh, they're coming out with them. Seems like a new one every day. They're all sub $200 price range for new out of the box. And, you know, the reason DMR took off was the $98 Ty Titera or the TYT radio because everybody was spending less than $100. And you can still buy that radio, by the way, for around $100 today. It's a very good radio. And it gets you started. It's very common. There's lots of code plugs out there for it. The, the CPS, the software to download, is free. And most of the time, it comes with a programming cable. That's the easy way to get into it from that standpoint. Once you get into Fusion, D-Star, now you're into the Japanese radios, and you're going to pay a little more money. I think has the code plug for the TYT3 380. 380. Uh, it does not have one for the MD 2017, which I can't find any of those. Send, send me an email. The, uh, I have a code plug for this 217. I haven't post, post. The conversion software that the fellow over in Kansas City wrote doesn't convert. It, it does. It will. it will. It has issues with the any tone. There's holes, like you were saying. but in my class, I go through that. I, I cover uh, Contact Manager, which is uh, uh, his software that allows you to convert from code plug to code plug. Uh, that's almost a whole class on itself. But you can, yeah. I have a, a 2017. I don't think I put it in the zip file, but send me an email. I'll do that. I've been busy for the past two months moving repeater systems, so as Kyle knows, pulling cat cable, putting up access points, everything like that. In the back. Any idea when the DMR repeater is going to get internet back? Well, we found out something Friday. We, we, we got an answer back. That's a long story, and I'm not going to go to, into it in the public forum. Uh, right after Labor Day, uh, I'm going to be getting internet reinstalled to that. Uh, after two months of solid working amateur radio like it was my job, my wife put up a fit, and so we're going out of town for Labor Day. <laughs> Good call. Good call. It's like, you know, no, this is almost as bad as when you work. You're supposed to be retired. I go, well, you know, I wasn't planning on having to move you know, six, seven repeater systems. So the guys in the engineering committee know that's not an easy task, and we didn't have a lot of time to do it. So, but yes, D Star and DMR, I am anticipating probably the second week of September will be back on the air internet wise. I apologize, but we ran into some problems we weren't anticipating, and so. That's life. There is an end in sight. I've been frustrated for the past month. Yeah. So I think I see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm just hoping it's not that freight train coming at me. Yes. Okay. Yes. On the any tone, is that is that compatible with the modal turbo on the any other of the of the DMR mode within? Yes. The same kind of compatibility that say that the uh, TYTMD has. Yeah, they're all what's called Etsy Tier Two compliant. Okay. That's what you want to look for in the radio. Is it is it DMR Tier Two compliant? And the TYT, I thought I wrote an ad saying on one of the TYT radios, someone found a software hack that lets them talk to all the digital modes. I mean, that like Fusion and. Uh, D-star. No. Nope. That that's rumor. It doesn't exist. Doesn't, doesn't there is a hack for the MD380 that lets you do promiscuous mode. That's kind of weird sounding, isn't it? Uh -huh. But promiscuous mode in DMR is what lets you monitor a DMR channel and hear all traffic on all talk groups on all time slots. So whatever is out there, you hear. It's also called in the any tone calls it DMR monitor, and you can put this in DMR monitor mode, and you can, which is great for traveling because you never know what talk groups on what, 
all for if you're traveling you program in one channel with the repeater and you put it in monitor mode and then you can capture the information that you need but there was a hack to do those sorts of things and to load the database of IDs versus call signs down into the radio. Mm -hmm. So like the Anytones and the TYTs will actually display the call sign. If you've hacked the TYT or the Anytone, doesn't need to hack, it does it already. Oh. You download the full database. Now, keep in mind that database is growing by thousands a, a month. And depending on the memory in those radios, it, some of them are going to run out of memory pretty soon. If some, some of them already have, I think, and can't hold the whole database. Do they have a micro SD card option for more memory? What's that? Is there a micro SD? No. 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 Uh, I think the database is close to 107,000 contacts, which are names that are out there. The database has been offline for a while. The database is hosted in Europe, and they ran into some European privacy standards issues with the database. Whoops. So now it only shows first name and call sign. It's global. Very interesting. Other questions? What was the name of that entry radio that you were talking about, an entry-level fusion radio? Empty re the entry-level fusion is... FT70DR. The interesting thing about Fusion and Yezu is they brought out DGID and they actually went back to the radios they no longer manufacture and they put it in there, which is kind of nice. But it, the entry level is the FT70DR. It's a single band at a time dual band radio and it will do all that. SDR Most of the new hotspots, they call hotspots now, Victor, more so, like the ZUM spot, uh, the open spot, those are multi-protocol. The ZUM spot now, and, and you, some of them, uh, the DV Mega boards with the, with the right software will do both bands, but they will do P25, NXDN, uh, D-Star, DMR and Fusion in one little box. Oh, the box? Okay. <laughs> and then you connect it to the internet. You tell it, I want you to be Fusion right now, and it's Fusion. Now, as we said, they're 95% the same, 100% incompatible. But now the hotspots have figured out how to make them compatible. You can take with a hotspot, if I'm getting too long, let me know. You can take a hotspot and configure it to go on a fusion with a DMR radio. Right. <clears throat> so if you have a DMR radio, you can talk on DMR and fusion on a hotspot. So basically, it will be from your radio to the hotspot. To the hotspot would be like a repeater that would be across town, right? No, the, the hotspot will be a little box inside your house connected to your internet. Okay. So it's a, your own local little repeater. And if you configure them right, you can change wires, X rooms, you can change talk groups, you can change reflectors, so on and so forth. But that's a whole nother talk <laughs> from that standpoint. Any other, I got another question back here. No, not really, because most networks are not taking that information and putting it out to like APRS, PHI, and all that. So there's no APRS gateway for DMR? Not that I'm aware of. There's not. I mean, you can still have it, but most of the radios won't even display it. I mean, I've got a couple up here that do it, but it's turned off because it eats battery. It's not like D-Star where it goes out the eye gate and shows up on APRS, PHI, where you can see where you've been, that sort of thing. Anything else? Well, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, George. Okay.